uh, mastering feature selection basics for developing your own algorithm. Uh, now probably this goes with the theme of open data science. So I want to give you some basics and uh, so this is the beginner level session. I want to give you some basics so you can develop algorithm on your own from simple intuition. So maybe first half I will try to pass 20 minutes. I will try to explain uh, what is feature selection, why people are still working on it, right? And then I, I will talk about some of our intuitions, how we have worked on it. By the way, I am uh, Shoptar Shi, I teach in University of Calcutta. And uh, I am also uh, an executive committee member of Society for Data Science. Uh, that is a non-profit organization trying to promote uh, data science activities uh, and nurture the community. And I'm also a life member of Mass Research Club. Okay, uh, so here is going to be my contents. So introduction, uh, what is feature selection? Why we do feature selection? Intuition to build a simple feature selection uh, algorithm, extension to graphs, and can we make naive base less naive? And then finally we conclude. So that is kind of uh, the outline. Okay, so uh, basically this is a pre-processing step and anywhere uh, you are do dealing with machine learning or data science, you are doing classification, clustering, regression, time series or recommender system, you are dealing with data, right? And uh, so you have rows and columns, the columns are your attributes or features or covariates, you know, depending on which community you are from. And the idea is to find a subset of the features without compromising on the model performance, right? Uh, you cannot compromise on the classification accuracy or the clustering validation rate that you are getting. So some other related terms I think uh, needs to mention is feature extraction, dimensionality reduction, feature engineering. So feature extraction is something where your data is unstructured. So you have images and you are trying to extract some shape features or texture features. So that is feature extraction. You have a text document, you are trying to find out the parts of speech, that is feature extraction. Dimensionality reduction is something if you have done, an example is principal component analysis. So you have features or attributes, but then you transform it. You make them a linear combination of the original features. So, uh, for for problems like you know uh, where domain understanding is very important, dimensionality reduction is not very recommended. Okay, how dimensionality reduction happens? So the variability of the data is remaining or or remains as is, but you try to uh, project it to some dimension so the variability is intact. So if you have 10 features, you may try to get three principal components which explain the same amount of variability. Now coming to feature engineering, probably all these that we three, the, the three things that we discussed come under feature engineering. Okay. Now let us see some of the uh, key benefits. So of course the model becomes more understandable. Uh, you can do a better visualization. <coughs> the model is generalized. It is efficient in terms of time and space complexity and your data collection effort goes down. And it has varied applications so starting from text, face recognition, image retrieval, medical diagnosis, recommender system. Uh, so it applies across various domains. So okay fine but still I mean is it a challenging problem? It, it still I mean seems quite simple. So now uh, how can how can we do that? So let us say uh, we have some. So what are feature subsets? So basically, if you look at this example, if I have a data set of three features, so that will have two to the power three minus one subsets. F one, F two, F three, F one, F two, F two, F three. Uh, I have missed F one, F three, and F one, F two, F three. So uh, these should be the seven subsets. And uh, let's say I have somehow defined a measure that how good the feature subset is. So if uh, the higher value means better, then the one on the top, only F1 is the best feature subset, right? So uh, looks quite good, right? I mean, why do we really uh, need to write our own algorithms or we need to study it, 
So one of the uh, data sets that, uh, that is called like Hello World of Computer Vision, the MNIST data set, uh, handwritten digit recognition, if you remember the input is a 28 into 28 pixel image. So 28 into 28 means 784 features. Okay. So uh, I'll show you what is the magnitude of 2 to the power 784. So this is 2 to the power 784. Okay. So this many subsets, if I even have a measure and I can go through them one by one. Okay. So that this is the number of subsets. Now let us say I have a computer and I can evaluate 10 to the power 8 feature subsets in a second. All right. So uh, I will do maybe uh, for years. So on no, all day, all years. So I will show you how many years it will take. So this many number of years it will take. Okay. So that's why you know people are still studying feature selection. And you can understand that 784 features is not big. Not large, right? Okay. So now I will uh, give you a uh, informal understanding. I hope you have already appreciated why feature selection is done. So this is the uh, you know bookish example of text classification, uh, classifying an email as a spam or a normal email, right? So generally, uh, the most simple form I think you represent a text by is counting the words that we have. So if you have maybe 500 emails even, so you will have 1000 distinct words, right? Lot of features, so you can understand uh, 2 to the power 1000 is a big number. So if somehow we can find that maybe uh, if we plot the normal emails and spam emails with respect to count of the word discount and count of the word free, they are separated like this. So of course, the ones that are uh, spam uh, they have higher numbers, right? Higher frequencies. So that way, your classification model will be very, very simple. Okay. So this is one of the motivations. So so far, we have described feature selection in the context of classification. Okay. And our talk will be on classification also, but just for uh, food for your thought. Uh, this is to give an example of clustering. So clustering is called about natural grouping, right? So uh, how will you naturally group them? Yes, so shape, color, some may say volume. So this, the like natural word is not very technical, right? So uh, doing feature selection is for clustering <coughs> is much more difficult than doing for classification. Okay, now I will discuss how to build a simple uh, you know, feature selection algorithm. Okay. Uh, so I will uh, talk about a publicly available data set in UCI as well as Kaggle. So it is a breast cancer data set. There are uh, 32 attributes. Okay. So first is the ID, identification number for the patient, not uh, required for the problem. Then the diagnosis, so whether the patient is malignant or benign. And uh, then you have 32 features which are real value. Okay, so uh, I have explained that how the real value, uh, real value attributes are calculated. Now, initially we can just do a descriptive statistics, and we can see. So I have not shown all the uh, features, but we start with this, and maybe we are lucky. We see that for some of the features standard deviation is zero. Even for the MNIST data set that I talked about, some features had standard deviation zero. So I can drop them. Maybe that is my first step. But before doing our algorithm, let us see what is a good feature and what is a good feature subset. So a good feature will be something which is uh, related to the target variable. So if I am thinking of placement success of a student, so I, an aptitude test score is a relevant measure and his or her blood group or his father's name or his native place may not be, may not have any bearing, so not relevant and not redundant. So I have given an example that uh, score of all mock tests may not be important. So you have taken a lot of mock tests, scores, 
maybe after six or seven mock tests, you have the same pattern coming in. And uh, so here I have put a question that is redundancy bad? I mean, if we get more features and they are redundant, is it bad? So I'll try to give you a like, small example. So maybe you know you are uh, preparing some sweet dish, okay? So uh, you have added one side sugar and also adding honey and maybe also adding jaggery. So of course you understand that it will be oversweet. So that's how if like you know you have uh, features which express the same information, your model will get confused or get biased towards that. Okay, so what will be a good feature subset? A good feature subset will have relevant features which are not redundant and as well as the feature subset is not unnecessarily large. Okay. Now, let us think of building some feature relevance measure. So what will be an intuition? Let us say we are talking about binary classification like the data set we saw. And if I want to plot at one side value of the features on x axis and y axis I want to maybe plot the frequency distribution or the probability distribution. So what should I want? I want them to be close or I want them to be separated. So I want them to be separated. So uh, here is a plot and you can see that feature 9 and 10, so are they discriminating or are they, do you feel they are relevant? So okay, let me tell you that uh, this is the uh, malignant plot and uh, the blue one is the malignant plot and the amber one is the benign plot, right? So they look quite identical, isn't it? So they are not discriminating. So, if you look at maybe feature 1, that is quite discriminating, feature 7, feature 8, they are quite discriminating. So, this can give you some idea, okay. And this is not uh, the only plot, right. So, you can also use a uh, box plot. So, it is, it is another way of looking at the same thing, but box plot gives you another thing which is the outliers. So, if you are comparing uh, between let us say uh, feature 2 and feature 8, they may have or feature 3 and feature 8, they may have same amount of uh, uh, like separability, but feature 8 has much more outliers. So, you want, uh, you want those features which has less outliers. Okay, so these are some intuitions. As I said that we want to build feature selection methods which are intuitive. Okay. Uh, and now, if this can be formulated in a numerical measure, we call this as a feature relevance measure. So, a very simple uh, algorithm, if I want to, you know, bring it. So, this is uh, just one reference of box plot in case, you know, you, you need to uh, refresh yourself off. So, I will not spend time on this. Okay. So, uh, a basic feature selection algorithm, I will give maybe two inputs. One is the data set and Another is the number of features I want to select. So I will rank the features by the feature relevance and I will take the top k features, right. So that will be my most basic feature selection algorithm. And there are several uh, options available. So I can take top n, I can take top p percentage or I can take where there is a significant drop. So what do I mean by that? So let us say there are 10 features. So feature 1 has a score 10, feature 8 has a score 9.5, feature 7 has a score 9, then there is a drop, the next feature maybe feature 4 has a feature relevance score of 4. So there is a significant drop and then we just stop at the first three features. So that is another way. Okay. So this, the, these steps just has been explained that you have the features, you have calculated the measures, you have ranked them and then you have taken the best features Okay, in three steps. So, this takes care of the relevance, but I talked about another thing. What was that? That was redundancy. So, we have not taken care of redundancy as yet. Okay. So, we can measure redundancy by correlation. So, this, uh, these two features show high correlation. It shows a Pearson correlation coefficient of 0 0.86 and has a very, very less p value. So, the correlation is statistically significant. Okay. So, how can I now add this redundancy to the simple algorithm that we built? Okay. So, uh, what we will do now is we will rank features, we will add features to the feature set, 
but when I evaluate the next feature, I will make sure that this doesn't have a high correlation with the features that I've already selected. Okay, so I have explained this with an example and of course, this needs another parameter, threshold or TH. So, it kind of tells you that how much, how much uh, correlation I will allow. Okay, so this is uh, an example. So, let us say I have a data set which has four features F1, F2, F3, F4 and relevant scores are 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.86 and 0 0.4 and I also have a uh, redundancy score. So, uh, you will see that the upper triangular matrix is unfilled or are marked with 0. So, uh, why? what is the reason of that? The reason is that they are symmetric. The correlation between F1 and F2 and F2 and F1 are the same. So, here if you look, of course, F1 has the highest correlation. So, I picked up F1 because it has 0 0.9. Next, F3 ha is the next one in terms of feature relevance, relevance 0 0.86. But when I start picking 0 0.86, I need to check whether with F1, it does not have a high correlation. So, when I check that, I see that it has a correlation of 0 0.7. So, and I have used a threshold of 0 0.67. So, I will not include this feature. This amount of redundancy is not allowed. So, I, my final uh, feature subset will be F1 and F2 as I have taken k equal to 2 and threshold equal to 0 0.67. Okay. So, now I think you have got an idea about how I can build a basic feature selection algorithm. Now, it is time to understand uh, in more detail about the feature selection family. So, in terms of approach, it can be thought as a filter approach, wrapper approach, an embedded approach and a hybrid approach. So, what is a filter approach? Filter approach actually evaluates some kind of uh, statistical property of the feature subset. Okay. So, I will see and we will see an example of that. So, it does not need any model. I take the feature subset and get a measure and then I can see which one is good or which one is not good. I have something as a wrapper, wrapper needs a model. So, wrapper what we do is we take the feature subsets and we train a model and see how good it is performing. So, that is the measure we use. Embedded means, so in all machine learning or data science models, you are trying to minimize the loss, how you can feed the model to the data, that should be minimized. Often, they also has a penalty function. Apart from the loss function, they have a penalty function, which kinds of uh, make sure that your model is not overly complicated. So, that you can make a function of the features. So, if you make it as a function of the feature, then it will not allow you to select subsets which has higher number of features. And of course, the name as suggests hybrid. So, you will start with maybe uh, filter approach, so you will filter out some features and then you can use wrapper. Uh, so, both has its advantage and disadvantages. In terms of reduction technique, it can be univariate. So, the ranking based method that we saw comes under univariate. It can be search based methods. So, you uh, find some strategy to search the entire feature subset space. Uh, again, I will give you an example and another is grouping based method. So, where you cluster features and try to pick some from each cluster. In terms of supervision, it can be either supervised or unsupervised, so for classification or clustering. In terms of output, it can be ranks, <coughs> so you get a rank set of features or it can be subset of features. <coughs> so, this is one example of, uh, of, of a measure that we are talking about. So, if you think, if you look at it, there are three things that are there. So, it is a function of three things. One is the cardinality of the feature subset. <coughs> so, basically SK is a feature subset. SK denotes uh, a feature subset and S denotes the cardinality of that feature. FIC actually indicates what is the relevance of individual feature of that feature subset. Okay. And FIFJ is the measure of the redundancy. Okay. So, now uh, so, this is a very uh, famous uh, feature selection algorithm, very highly cited, uh, which is called as MRMR. Uh, it is uh, like minimize redundancy, maximize relevance. So, that is the term. 
and uh, again i have given an example that how it works so if you have a uh, feature relevance score given and feature redundancy matrix given so you can simply evaluate uh, them one by one so i have taken f1 f2 f3 and f2 f3 f5 just as an example both has same feature relevance measure both have feature relevance measure of 0.5 but uh, f1 f2 f3 has a lower interaction of 0.07 than f2 f3 f5 has a higher interaction of 0.12 so the first feature subset is better but this only you know kinds of allow so if you have a feature subset you can measure its relevance so that's all you can do but still we are not sure that the uh, large na large number i saw showed you in context of mnist how this will handle that right so for that there are several search techniques that are available okay so and i uh, so that is a subject by itself that is a subject by itself so basically uh, search methods can be you know differentiated between continuous and discrete okay so continuous and discrete means that uh, the variables that i am dealing with is of continuous nature or of discrete nature so in our case when we are doing a feature subset selection we are actually dealing with discrete feature set so what do we or uh, discrete input so what do we mean by that so let us say if you have five features and five features in a data set and you want to select only one the first feature and the fifth feature so you actually represent this as a binary string you represent this as 1 0 0 0 1 so that's why it comes under discrete search okay and discrete search again can be split into complete methods or approximate methods so complete methods means that it can find the optimal solution <coughs> uh like branch and bound or or like dynamic programming or maybe the one that i told you that i will do one by one the brute force method so these are complete methods but you can understand that that will not work so there are some approximate approximate methods which can be you know roughly uh bifurcated into nature inspired like genetic algorithm or particle swarm optimization or other methods like simulated annealing so how do we do a search we start we have a original set of features we generate a subset we evaluate how good it is if it you know uh, fit, fits my termination criteria i end there else i again generate feature subset so that's how typically a search process continues okay so now i will move to something called as graph based feature selection okay so again uh this is a public data set uh, breast tissue data set so it measures electrical impedance of freshly excised tissue samples from the breast okay and uh, the problem in hand is predicting the class value so this is not binary classification you have several classes six classes so carcinoma fibroadenoma mesopathy glandular connective and adipose and you have nine features you have nine features and uh, uh, the features descriptions are there but uh, let us try to see that how i have a data set from here how can i generate a graph so i was talking about intuitions right so how can i generate a graph from here using that intuition so let us start with the correlation matrix so i have created a Or, or I am showing the correlation matrix. You will see that some of them has very high correlation, 0.98. So if you remember, the range of correlation is from minus one to plus one, right? And actually, uh, do you think uh, the sign matters? No, it doesn't matter, right? The absolute value is what matters. So we have quite high correlation for some of them, and very low correlation for some of them. So good. now we have a uh, correlation matrix can we convert it into a graph any any thoughts perfect perfect so how to convert this into a graph what will be the nodes and edges and how a graph is represent, represented as a matrix right so uh, 
some of you may not be from uh, computer science background, but uh, generally we use graph whenever there is a relationship. So social networking being the typical example. So you, it's, it, you show that in terms of graphs and uh, how typically a graph is represented in a matrix in terms of an adjacent symmetry. So you have a graph and uh, for you have that amount of uh, rows and columns as you have nodes, right? And then uh, one means that there is, a, there is an edge between A to B. So wherever there is one, that means there is an edge between D to E if you see uh, the fourth one, okay. So, as she suggested, so one of the way, so there are two ways I can create a graph out of the correlation matrix. One is I created a weighted <coughs> graph. So that will be fully connected graph, right? All nodes will be connected to each other. And for some of them, what will happen is, or or an alternative approach can be, I use a threshold. I use a threshold. I will keep an edge only when, because we were keeping a threshold of 0 0.67 if you remember. So uh, I will create, I will keep an edge only when it is more than that threshold, else there will not be an edge. So if we apply that on the data set, then what will happen is, I will get a graph like this out of the data set that I have. So we call that as a feature association map, okay, or fan. So now can you tell me that uh, how can I select some features out of it or at least this much is very intuitively clear to you that there is a big cluster where features are interconnected and there are two features which are out of that cluster. So probably uh, something like I can pick one or two from this and two from outside so that can give me a good feature subset. Okay. So this is again. We are, we are telling about the intuition, how you can uh, use correlation matrix to tackle the problem of redundancy. So here is another uh, concept of graph, which is called as vertex cover. So vertex cover is first of all, a set of nodes, okay, is a set of nodes and vertex cover ensures that if you have a relationship, right, so relationship means it is an edge at least one side of the edge is picked up. So that means the relationship is covered. And you try to do it minimally because there will be some uh, nodes which explains two relationships. So in that case, I will maybe pick up the one that is present in both of them. So this concept is called as the minimal vertex cover. But again, this is a like it is it is very polynomially hard problem to solve okay now uh, this is just by intuition so if you have a graph like this uh, you can see that 4 2 covers all the four edges that are there so there are four edges and five nodes in the graph so if you uh, pick 4 and 2 or 4 or 0 4 and 0 then they covers all the relations so, from the cluster that I was showing you here, if I use vertex cover and uh, take those features, so that will give me a good starting point. So, but it is difficult to get uh, the minimal or minimum vertex cover, but we can get the minimal. So, let us not split here on that, but uh, a very simple algorithm can be, I will start uh, with the result set as empty. And then I pick any uh, arbitrary edge, maybe having uh, nodes like u and v. So I add u and v to the result set and whatever edges were connected to u and v, incident on u and v, I will remove them from the graph. Again, I will pick an arbitrary edge, add those in my result set and reduce the graph until when the graph does not exist. So this is how I can form a very simple algorithm. So, so we applied this on the data set that we I, I described and all feature accuracy was 62% uh, or 62.1% with this it came to 65.5 maybe not a great improvement uh, around 3.5% but with a feature reduction of 55.56%.
and uh, uh, I will show you some other feature association maps. So you get very very interesting patterns when you so this is a uh, particularly well studied. Uh, if you look at Figure three, it's a particularly well studied data set called as Madelon data set. So if I am not wrong, it has five hundred features. Uh, it was given in a competition, so only fifteen features were uh, were good. Others were created by noise. And probably when we, we are using this uh, graph, we are uh, kind of getting the features which are relevant. All those noises are getting away because they are not related to each other. And uh, this was another where, okay, so there is a color coding. There is a color coding. So if it is green, that means there is redundancy, but redundancy is moderate. If it is blue, that means the <coughs> redundancy is little bit higher and if it is red that means it has redundancy with more than one feature okay so that's how we have color coded it so the idea is that even be before you start uh, start building your model so this is something you can take to your user or customer and show this map and ask them because so a uh, lot of uh, people in the community will do dimensionality reduction right so as i said that one of the uh, advocacies of using feature selection is that it retains the original feature meaning. So this is where you can you know engage with your customer and ask him that see this this is where there is a set of redundant features which want to be kept. Okay, and uh, so this we run on quite a few data sets. So these are few of the data sets that we have uh, ran this against. Okay, and. Uh, I will show you our results on both supervised and unsupervised. So UFAM or unified FAM, that was our method. So you will see that that has achieved uh, the best classification accuracy and the mean rank is also lowest. So what we mean by mean rank is, so this is also one standard way of comparing algorithms. So you find out that which ranks best and then you take a mean of this and this is more robust than uh, the average accuracy because in average accuracy what can happen is that for one data set some algorithm may give very high accuracy which can compensate for you know loss in or, or uh, losing out on other data sets. So that is why mean rank is a much more robust measure. So UFAM actually performed much better in all contexts of, of the three. So we discussed about MRMR. So we have got a better result than that. And uh, so I am not showing you execution time. In execution time, why, why is also our methods were much more simple and much more uh, <coughs> like to uh, so if so there was an order of magnitude reduction. Okay, so if it was in minutes, we were doing in seconds. And in uh, unsupervised also, we got a very very good result. Uh, so uh, for uh, clustering, you don't measure by accuracy, you measure by purity. And uh, basically, which measures how homogeneous the clusters are. So there also we achieved uh, best mean rank may not be the best average purity. Average purity wise, our method was second best. Okay, so this was about the graph based uh, feature selection. Now uh, let's come to uh, the text example that we are talking about. Okay, so. Uh, we, we are sure we have heard about lot of text classification in uh, last two days and uh, basically you have input as a document and output is a label. So some examples are spam classification or sentiment analysis, you, you, you can do a topic clustering, uh, you can determine the gender of the person who is writing. So a lot of text classification tasks are there. And uh, name based classifier, uh, you know that it works on conditional probability. Now uh, can any one of you tell that why naive base is called naive? Uh, so that is because the that's why it is called base. So why it is called naive? Assumes all features are independent. Right. So uh, this is one empirical study we did on some textual data sets. And you can see that we have compared naive base 
with decision tree support vector machine and KNN. And uh, can you see that NAPBASE was poorest or was getting the lowest accuracy in terms of uh, classification accuracy. So these are classification accuracy figures. Okay. So uh, that was kind of a motivation to improve uh, NAPBASE. Can we do something to improve this? So can you uh, can can you think of something uh, so you know it can be improved? So basically, I will give you a clue. So what NEPBES expects? NEPBES expects that the features are independent. So can I give it features which are kind of independent to each other, right? So that's what we try to do. Here. That's what. So it is. We cannot ensure a complete independence, but we can ensure that. Uh, they will have you know, less independence. So uh, now, uh, how can we do that? So we can simply cluster them. And what is the property of clustering? In clustering, within, uh, within the cluster, the features are homogeneous and between the cluster it is heterogeneous. So if I pick if I can do it in such a manner that I pick features from each cluster or some features from each cluster, maybe that will give me more independent words, right? So, of course, in case of uh, our method, the features are the words, okay? All right. So, these are some very simple steps. So, we start by forming the term document matrix. So, this is the baseline way of, you know, taking the structure out of text. So, of course, you can use topic modeling, right? And again, you can use word embedding. So, the newer methods that have come up. But let us focus on term document matrix for now. So, what we do then is we transpose it. So, because if I uh, cluster the term document matrix, then we'll be clustering the document. We don't want to do that. We want to cluster the words. So, we'll just take a transpose of that term document matrix. And we'll create k clusters. So I'm not going into term like deciding how we'll get k cluster. There are several ways for that. And uh, then we select the most representative word from each cluster, so which is closest to the clustering center. Because in k, so we have applied k means. So k means, you know, one of the problem of k means is the center is not a word, right? So what we have done is we have. Uh, calculated the EPDR norm, which is the closest to the center, and that word we have picked up in the feature subset. Okay. So here are the results. So we have now run on a much larger uh, uh, text data sets, and uh, uh, you can see that, that there is a remarkable improvement in terms of classification accuracy that we have achieved. So you might definitely question that, okay, Good, you have improved name base, but is it comparable with other uh, classification algorithms? So here is a comparison of the data. So if you see that apart from the first data set, all other data sets, we have got better results using the methods that we have applied. So another challenge that you might throw at our method is that is it doing good compared to other feature selection methods? So we have compared with a uh, forward search based wrapper. You already know what is wrapper. In a forward, in a wrapper method, forward search, greedy. Okay, so we have greedily picked up the features. And if you see that in all the data sets, we have achieved better classification accuracy. But that is not the most important point. The most important point is the time that we have taken. Just look at the time, the first data set, uh, that algorithm took 53 minutes and our algorithm took less than a minute. Okay. So, that is about uh, the execution efficiency, if I may call it. <laughs> and now coming to the feature reduction. So, this is the feature reduction that we are achieving. So, you can see that in some cases, there were more than 3000 features and we have come down to 3. Okay. So, uh, it, it gives you uh, like much reduced feature space. So probably we can start drawing like the dream that we are having, 
that will draw in two dimension and uh, you know uh, bifurcate spam and ham so we are almost at that level okay okay so uh, that is about uh, what i had to discuss now a quick conclusion so if you have understood why feature selection is important for any machine learning pipeline and with large dimension what happens is this traditional concepts of neighborhood searching you know finding kernels either becomes too expensive or becomes completely black box so what you can do is you can follow your intuitions which feeds the model uh, or the data and build your own model method so that's what i actually wanted to motivate you to start doing okay so here are some other areas that we are working on so you are working uh, quite seriously on forecasting of solar and wind energy generation we are work also working on developing some algorithms in quantum machine learning we are doing some work on aspect based sentiment analysis and feature selection being my you know phd topic so i continue working on that in different dimension so some other areas what where we are working on fuzzy and non parametric feature selection and i will uh, end uh, by uh, talking about uh, icdmi it is a conference uh, international conference of data analytics management and innovation to happen next year uh, new delhi uh, uh, january 17 to 19 so the call for papers are up and i uh, definitely uh, you know uh, encourage or invite you to give papers here so we can again meet in delhi in january and i also acknowledge mass research club for especially joy mustafi for encouraging us to you know submit proposals to odsc okay so thank you and uh, any questions yes yes also what we have done in another word so we call that as feature information map or feature association map to take care of what you are talking about so there we remove features which is very low relevance so that is at the first taken care so the graph is much smaller in size and we are only dealing with relevance the last thing so uh, for the uh, graph method earlier uh, so we talked about correlation which will only work for uh, continuous and linear things uh, for other things are there again uh, heuristics that this for example for this case, yes so so used. for categorical you can use measures like chi square yeah. but uh, one problem is when you are dealing with different or mixed domains so bringing them to same scale and comparing is a challenge so so far what we have thought is we'll deal uh, them separately and then kind of combine Uh, my question is about uh, so in your in your techniques do you treat the hyperparameters and features separately? 
because both ah. of them uh, there is an over there both of them interact with each other right? how do you solve for the best subset and the best subset or best uh, hyperparameters at the same so that is all about heuristic so uh, so generally we don't uh, you know uh, invest a lot of our time on hyperparameters because we are modeling people okay so we generally refer literature see if that is working well only when we see now it is not giving a, at all a good result we think of modeling and then like you can do hyperparameter tuning using a grid search or a more intelligent search we use things like that okay, so you are treating them as independent problems yes yes Well, that's a very good question. So, uh, one of the ways is looking at the entropy of the features. Also, there is something called as a Laplacian scale. Okay. So, which kind of sees that what is the neighborhood of 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 the data points, and from there it derives a score based on the features. So, which has a you know, good local structure that is a good feature. Something something of that sort. Okay. And we also have developed our own method, which is based on principal component analysis. So we try to find out features. So we have converted the unsupervised problem to supervised. So we have we are treating kind of principal components, and now my uh, target variable. So we have used that as a proxy, and that also has given us quite a good result. 